Today we're, we're very fortunate to have the editor of Socialist Review magazine, Sally Campbell. Sally's going to introduce a discussion on do we need violence to get real social change? Cheers. Um, so I think, I suspect that everyone in this room, most people that we meet who are socialists, people who are attracted to the idea of changing the world uh, and making it a better place, do that in large part because they want to see an end to violence. And I think all of us look around the world and see violence everywhere, really. We see the butchery that's going on in Syria at the moment with Assad's forces and ISIS and all the other imperialist powers getting involved, you know, bombing the population in order to position themselves to rule the wasteland afterwards. You know, we see the horror of, of the Grenfell Tower fire where people have died really in the most horrific circumstances because they're poor, because they're black, because they're migrants, and, and because of all those reasons they weren't listened to. You know, we see violence in all kinds of ways, the violence of austerity, which has seen something like 10,000 extra suicides um, in, in Britain since um, 2010. We've seen the death of 2,650 benefit claimants who died soon after being found fit for work in their benefits assessments. You know, and we see... The, the violence of a, of a racist state machine, you know, the police who kill black people in the street and, and never get prosecuted. You know, all of these things, and we could go on, of course, for, for weeks with, with examples of the kind of violence that I think all of us look around and see and that we want to, want to see an end to. Um, and I think we, you know, we always have to start from that when we're discussing the question of the potential you know, use of violence on our side, the use of violence to try and change the world, because I think we always have to start from saying, where does the violence really come from in this society? And I think it's really important to say that violence is structured into the capitalist um, system. Um, we live in a society that's divided into classes, you know, as many societies have been before. You know, our society is divided into you know, different classes, but primarily those, you know, based on exploitation, based on a minority who own and control the wealth and the means of creating wealth and the majority who have to work for them to make a living. Um, and we live in a class society which has a state. It has a state which has arisen precisely because of those divisions in our society, because it's based on exploitation and because also the ruling class uses all kinds of oppression against different groups in society. And those divisions are irreconcilable. You know, there's no halfway between the exploited and the exploiter. There's no kind of uh, nice um, uh, position that you can come to in between. There are two different, fundamentally different interests um, in society, more than two, in fact. And, um, and the state, I think, rises up and exists in order to maintain the rule of that minority at the top of society and, and to make sure that the system keeps running smoothly. You know, so the forces of the state, whether it's the police or the army um, or whatever, are used to defend property in our society. They're used to crush resistance, to try and put down strikes or, or demonstrations, you know, to keep everything going. And all of this is done, I think, with a breathtaking level of hypocrisy when you think about the kind of moral hand-wringing that we often get in the media or from our you know, politicians and rulers at instances of violence you know, between individuals. You, know, you think about you know, the kind of stuff you get in the Evening Standard in London all the time um, about uh, violent protesters or whatever every time there's a kind of confrontation on the streets or against, you know, the, the brutalised, you know, people who uh, attack each other, uh, you know, knife crime and so on. Um, and I think all the time, the reason it's so hypocritical is because they're always denying any kind of link between the violence that happens in society, between individuals or, or, um, or in terms of wars and, and all the rest of it, and the roots of that kind of violence in the system that they defend. And I think it's no surprise that a system as brutal as our one, and remember this is a society, you know, on a global scale, where eight people own as much wealth as three and a half billion people, where that is considered legitimate and normal and something we should all just accept really, that kind of society that is so divided in that way, it brutalizes people. And so people do, you know, turn on each other. People do, you know, find that, that relationships between human beings are distorted and, um, and um, you know, and can become violent and so on. And I think, 
our ruling class um, kind of d does this kind of brutalizing and distorting of human relationships um, on that level of just the experience of, uh, you know, people's uh, lives living in this kind of divided society, but also in quite a conscious way of stirring up divisions on the basis of nationality or skin colour or gender uh, and so on. Uh, and I think all of that does, you know, ramp up the level of violence um, in our society. And the state also, you know, reflects the divisions um, that exist in society. Uh, and it reflects those oppressions like racism, for example. We think about the fact that over the past 13 years, one black person has died at the hands of the state in Britain on average every month. But in the past four decades, not a single police officer has been prosecuted for killing a black person in their custody. You know, you think about the prison system. One person commits suicide every three days in a British prison on average. You know, and there's a hundred incidents of self-harm in prison every day. You know, there's, there's levels of violence that people inflict upon themselves and on each other which are absolutely a consequence of the kind of divided society we live in, but which always are blamed on those individuals somehow. And I think, of course, it's not just that the state enforces kind of the capitalist rule at home, it also enforces, enforces it abroad. It tries to extend, uh, you know, the power of British capital against other capitals. Um, you know, and there's lots of different capitalist states, they're all trying to dominate the globe, and that means that those powers clash with each other. Um, and so we have this mad situation of the arms races, the nuclear um, weapons and so on, um, proliferating across the globe and creating this kind of you know, situation where we have both the horrific you know, and very messy wars that we're seeing played out in various parts of the world at the moment, but also just that constant threat in the back of our minds about nuclear weapons and, and the idea of, of the kind of potential destruction that could take place. And the world states have gathered those kind, those kind of weaponry, means of absolutely massive destruction uh, and violence on a scale that's never been seen before. So last year, $1.5 trillion was spent on arms. That's enough to end extreme poverty globally for 25 years. Now, you know, I'm going on and on about this, but I think it's really important to identify where violence starts uh, uh, and why it's so important that we end this system and think about what we need to do to end this system uh, uh, and create um, a, a democratic and, and peaceful and just one. And I think, you know, the final thing that, that capitalism does is not just the kind of direct violence of, you know, arms and, and war and, uh, you know, police violence and so on. But it is that kind of, that basic everyday level of violence, of the violence of austerity, the violence of poverty, you know, the violence of what those three and a half billion people are missing out on because eight people somewhere else own that, that amount of wealth. You know, this is a society where there are fundamentally different interests um, that clash with each other not to mention environmental crisis, you know, and, and so on and so forth. Now, if we want to end this kind of violence that I'm talking about, the violence of a capitalist system, then we have to challenge that system, and ultimately, I think we have to overthrow it. I think if we rule out violence uh, in advance altogether, you know, on a, on a moral basis or whatever, then I don't think we'll be able to do that. I think, first of all, just on a basic level, people will fight back. People have always fought back against oppression and against exploitation. Uh, they will do that whether we like it or not, whether we argue with them to do it or not. People will do that. People respond to repression and, and exploitation. And some of those struggles involve violence. And again, they always have done. You know, think about slave uprisings, peasant revolts, uh, revolutions that, that have happened many times over the past uh, centuries. And... You know, when people fight back and if they use violence to do that, maybe individual acts or, or you know, kind of riots and, and stuff like this, do we condemn those people for responding to, to a violent system in that way? I don't think we do, actually. We don't condemn um, people who rioted against police violence um, back in 2011, you know, starting in London, in, in Tottenham, and then spreading all over the place. We didn't condemn... Um, the Asian communities in Bradford who fought back against the Nazis who were marching in 2001, you know, and a whole bunch of, of young Asian men were arrested 
for, um, for defending their community, really, against violent Nazis who'd come in to try and stir up, um, stir up trouble. I think we, we defend the victims of racism when they fight back, however they do it. We don't condemn workers who organise to protect their picket line. We don't, you know, condemn Palestinian children who fight back against the IDF, you know, and, and their, um, the occupation of, of their land or, or their homes. You know, so I think on a basic level, we defend the right of oppressed and exploited people to fight back against that oppression by any means necessary, as people say. Now, that's not the same as saying that we think that's necessarily the right way to fight back or it's the best strategy. And I'm going to move on to these kind of ideas about what kind of strategy should you have. Because um, I think lots of people would agree with that. You know, lots of people would agree that it's right to defend people fighting back, you know, and, and self-defense is no offense and, and so on but that we should never um, advocate violence uh, in terms of as, you know, setting out to do it. Um, and I think people uh, often look to two of the most famous um, non-violent uh, resistance movements, of, uh, that of Mahatma Gandhi uh, against British rule in India and Martin Luther King, of course, in, in the civil rights movement in America. And I'll have a quick look at those, you know, not in big detail, but just to kind of, I think, show that both of the, those movements were a lot more complex than simply non-violence won the day. Um, Gandhi was fighting for Indi Indian independence from the, from the British Empire. You know, and some of the non-violent movements that he created were absolutely inspiring and, and, and successful and impressive. You know, it, it, one of the early campaigns he was involved in, I think it's around 1919, um, in Ahmedabad, he led a successful non-violent campaign against unjust tax rises, you know, we involve thousands of peasants. They, they kind of uh, surprised the government, really, with how effectively they organized and, and they won. Uh, he also led, later, a nationwide rebellion against the prohibition of making salt. You know, he did lots of things which involved this kind of mass uh, nonviolent protests. Um, but also, a lot of the protests that took place in India you know, non-violent or otherwise, were met with repression by the British state, which was ruling. They would send in the army um, and so on. You know, one of the most famous instances is the Amritsar massacre in 1919, which was, you know, a kind of a protests were taking place in response to Gandhi being arrested after a series of protests had already taken place and, and so on. So it's a whole ongoing series, an interaction if you like, between who has the upper hand. Is it the government or is it the movement? And this is, you know, kind of an ongoing battle. Um, so men, women and children were protesting about the arrest of Gandhi. British troops fired on them and literally killed hundreds of people. Um, and actually, you know, that, of course, led to more protests, to, to riots and stuff afterwards. And actually, Gandhi responded by condemning the rioters in that case and saying they should stop protesting in that way. They should go back, um, go back to work, really, and stop, uh, you know, and try to shut down that movement. Um, I think this isn't, you know, uh, obviously a lot of people... Uh, Gandhi is held up as someone who held this kind of moral position of, of non-violence in principle. Um, I think in reality, if you look at his life, that, that isn't really the case. I mean, during the First World War, he was recruiting for the army, not just really to show that Indians were capable of that, but also to show to Indians that they maybe needed to learn how to use arms if they were seriously going to kick out um, the British. I think what's more important, though, than Gandhi's individual morality is the different class interests that were involved in that movement. And I think this applies to, to the civil rights movement as well. There were different class interests involved. Gandhi wanted independence for India. He wanted a kind of Indian capitalism that, that could therefore, you know, compete on a level playing field with, with other capitalist powers. And if that's what you're aiming for, then you want to limit the movement because once you start unleashing mass movements against oppression and exploitation, it doesn't necessarily stop with just the British <laughs> exploiters. You know, you can start to look to the, you know, the, the local ruling class um, as well. Um, so, so to quote Gandhi, he said at one point, in India, we want no political strikes. We must gain control over all the unruly and disturbing elements. We seek not to destroy capital or capitalists, but to regulate the relations between capital and labor. We want to harness capital to our side. You know, he wants to reform. He wants to make capitalism better, but he doesn't want to overthrow it. Um, and that means keeping the movement within certain constraints. I think in reality, that, that didn't happen in the movement in India. 
and Gandhi represented one component in that movement against British rule. There was also strike waves, there was also riots, there was also armed uprisings, there was bombings of police stations, there was, you know, the constant threat that I think the British felt of, of you know, more radical and, and violent movements against them. And, and crucially, in 1946, there was a mutiny in the army, and this was really something that, that turned the tide um, and forced the British out. Um, so I think in that movement, there was a complex interaction of, of different kind of strategies, and all of them actually added up to a movement which kicked out, um, kicked out the British. When you look at Martin Luther King, uh, it's a similar thing, really. King emerged out of the, the Montgomery bus boycott movement. He led this powerful mass movement um, against segregation uh, around the, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And again, it was a movement that involved different class forces and, and employed the tactic of nonviolence, I think, for, for different reasons, for different elements of that movement. So you think about the kind of the middle class elements they look to non-violence in a similar way that, that Gandhi did. They want a non-revolutionary approach that can end uh, segregation, that, that appeals to the northern ruling class to be fair, really, and to stop you know, holding back black people. Um, for the mass of poor black people, there's also a very sensible, I think, or a very understandable element of um, you know, the fear that if it came to any kind of violent resistance, that they'd be smashed because the forces of the state were so strong and so clearly so willing to, to smash black people who struggled against their oppression. So in lots of ways, it's more a question of tactics and, and not allowing yourselves to be completely smashed um, rather than a question of principle. And really, that, that movement for, um, for the end of segregation for, for black civil rights... Um, kind of the aim was to con kind of force the northern political elite to intervene and use the state, use organized violence to, um, to force desegregation. And I think that's really clear when you think about those images, the famous images from Little Rock, where they were de forcing the desegregation of schools. And you've got these teenagers in 1957 going into school, um, kind of um, being escorted in by the federal army, you know, with jeering racists from, from the south ar uh, around them. You know, it's, it's kind of, it's a non-violent movement that is using the, the threat of, of violence to enforce, actually, the, their rights. Um, so it's not the case that it's simply this kind of moral question of non-violence. It's that, you know, it's about using different, different elements of the state to, to try and aim for something. And I think also throughout that civil rights movement in the 50s, and the early 60s, there was always this kind of implicit threat, and sometimes explicit, that if you don't deal with us, the non-violent movement, then there is another movement waiting in the wings which won't be so friendly and, and compliant, really. And, and that obviously was entirely the case later on in the 60s when the movement reached a bit of an impasse, really, and the non-violent approach broke down. So even the organisation that was called the Student Non-Violent Coordinating Committee adopted a position of, of support for self-defense, um, at, at the very least, for armed self-defense um, against the state and against the racists. You know, so the movement that won civil rights involved large numbers of people who were prepared to use force, if necessary, to, to win their rights and to defend themselves um, against the racists and against the state. You know, so I think that, you know, ad adopting a principle of nonviolence in itself, you know, as a principle is, is wrong. But I also think when we look at movements of the past, you know, it's never really been that simple either. And it's, you know, it's, it's a, a particular narrative of the movement that they like to teach us in school, of course, that this is the best way to struggle. But actually, you know, what, what has been won um, has been won by, by more, uh, more, you know, more things than, than, than nonviolence. Now, I'm saying that I think we should reject uh, nonviolence as a principle. That doesn't mean 
that I'm uh, arguing that individual acts of violence or terrorism or, or any of these things are, are an effective way to fight. I don't, you know, I don't think we should advocate terrorist attacks or assassinations, tempting that it may be with certain world leaders in the area. We don't advocate sending small minorities of armed you know, revolutionaries into the situation to sort things out on our behalf and then we'll join them later or whatever. You know, whether that be on a kind of on a revolution scale, you know, or whether that be, you know, when we want to fight the Nazis or fight the police or something, you know, just having a small minority of armed people who to go to go and do that isn't the way to go. First of all, it's wrong because mostly it won't win, you know, precisely because the state has that monopoly on organized violence. It's very difficult to take them on on that level, you know, on the level of uh, we've got a, a few Kalashnikovs and they've got Trident or whatever, you know, it's, it's quite difficult to, to win. Now, of course, sometimes small armed movements can win, absolutely, if the state is in crisis, if it's crumbling, you know, you think about Cuba or something, it wasn't masses and masses of people, it was an armed band of people were able to march in and overthrow a very nasty, corrupt, crumbling regime that everybody hated, you know, so... It's not that it can never win uh, on that level of, of achieving its immediate aim, um, but it will nearly always lose unless the circumstances happen to be absolutely right. I mean, you think about various times that the left, the forces of the left, anti-capitalist forces have tried to uh, use um, armed uprisings in that way. The Zapatistas, you know, who had a fantastic um, kind of uprising, but end up hemmed in and like surrounded by the state, really, because the state is is always going to win on that level. But the more important reason that I think it's the wrong strategy is because it's undemocratic. It's not what we're talking about, I think, as socialists, when we talk about transforming the world. It, it, because it, if it's, you're talking about a minority of armed people, then you're denying the mass of workers, the mass of ordinary people, the right to emancipate themselves and to be part of the struggle that overthrows um, the system. I think we advocate a mass movement, a, a revolutionary movement in the end, in which the vast majority democratically impose their will on the will of the minority who currently run things, you know, who currently run, uh, uh, run capitalism. And they begin the process of creating a classless society where there is no exploitation, there is no minority that, that owns and controls the means of production. You know, and that's what Marx talked about when he talked about revolution. It's necessary because you have to overthrow capital, you have to you know, seize the means of production uh, and so on. But also, you need to make the working class fit to rule. You know, uh, revolution is a process that transforms the ideas of the people who take part in it. If it's a minority doing it and everyone else is sitting around waiting for them to finish, then the majority of people are not going through that process and are not kind of transforming their own ideas. You know, and I think that if that, that's the case, then you don't get the kind of fundamental change that, that I think we all are looking for. Um, and, yeah, so, so I think we do need to use force in the sense of revolutionary force of overthrowing the system. Uh, I'm arguing that a, min a minority of people who are armed can't necessarily do that against the state, can't really win. But can a mass revolutionary movement win against the violence of the state? Um, and I think... For us here, the crucial question isn't really about the violence. It's not where we start from. It's about the balance of forces. You know, we're talking about a battle, really, aren't we? At, at most of the time, the ruling class has the upper hand in the sense that they've got that monopoly on violence, on organized violence, that they've got all kinds of uh, advantages of owning and controlling the wealth in society, of, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, but actually, at, at certain points, you know, and, and we can look back at revolutions and see this, that balance can shift quite a lot. And actually, it's always shifting every day. You know, there are little shifts this way and that. You think about how weak the ruling class feels at the moment compared to how it felt maybe two years ago, you know, uh, and, and so on. Um, I want to look at Russia in 1917 to, to, look at, to look at this point, really, because the revolution in Russia began as a mass spontaneous uprising, you know, that kind of response to the horrible repression of the Tsar's regime, 
and it was an absolutely brutal regime. It was, you know, there was no democracy. There was a horrific kind of repression of any kind of political um, dissent against the system. People weren't allowed to speak their own languages across the whole swathe of the Russian Empire. You know, all, all kinds of things. One of the first things that the revolution did when, when people kind of came out on the streets and it just like snowballed over four days in, in February, you know, so within four days, the Tsar had to resign. You had to install a, um, a parliament that would actually have powers uh, and so on. One of the first things the revolution did was open up the prisons where political prisoners had been, literally coming out, stumbling into the daylight, who hadn't seen daylight since 1905, the previous revolution. You know, these are people who were kind of falling to their knees in the streets and being brought new boots by people, you know, and, and so on. This is like a kind of horrific, violent society that Tsarist Russia was, and it's what people responded to. And there was quite a lot of violence in the course of the Russian Revolution in the first few months. And this, I think you completely understand that. It's an expression and a, a, of overthrowing such a brutal system. And remember... Uh, the major driving force for that revolution was the war. It was the First World War, the most horrendous example of organized violence that the world had ever seen up to that point. Um, and that's what people wanted to see an end to. So any violence that did take place in Russia in 1917, I would argue, is nothing. It's nothing compared to what they were trying to end um, uh, and what had been going on for, for three years by that point. Um, uh, but what was crucial, what made that revolution successful was that um, the Tsar, the Tsar's regime, was no longer able to rely on the army to back up its power. You know, it could no longer rely on the, um, the organized um, power of, of the, the organized violence of the state. Um, in the capital, Petrograd, and in other major cities as well, when the revolution broke out, um, Soldiers were, you know, who were being sent in to, to stop the crowd, stop the revolution. Um, you know, you think about who those soldiers were. They were mostly drawn from the peasantry. They were looking around and seeing literally members of their family or people who looked exactly like members of their family, and, you know, and seeing working class people who were starving, you know, other soldiers coming back from the war completely demoralized and so on. They could not be relied on to fire on the crowd. And faced with the pressure of that revolutionary upsurge, the state machine split. Uh, the ruling class was not able to impose chain of command and, and make that meaningful. And that's when they lose control. That's when they lose it, really, and have to back down. Um, it spent most of the next six months trying to re-establish that chain of command and, and clearly was not um, successful. And I think that's a really important contradiction in the state that we should think about because the state exists to defend ruling class interests, but actually most of the people who actually do the defending tend to be drawn from the working class, from, from oppressed classes in society. Uh, and that is very clear. You can see that today in Britain as well. You think about the way that army recruitment fairs set up in County Durham and all, all the poorest areas of the country to recruit teenagers who they think, ah, oh, these people will feel hopeless and like they've got no future. Let's get them in the army and give them, you know, uh, uh, get them kind of disappointed disciplined and, and all the rest of it. And I think that's, that's why there's such an enormous importance placed on obedience in the army, on unthinking obedience. Don't think about what you're defending here. We'll tell you it's the British interest or whatever, you know, and just, just um, do what you're told. And I think in revolutionary situations, that is precisely what breaks down. And, and it has to break down if we're going to win, actually, because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about cracking the state machine and, uh, and kind of pulling it apart. By October in 1917, when the actual insurrection happened, led by the Bolsheviks, um, the balance of forces had shifted even more. The, the working class, the bulk of the working class, had won, been won over to the idea they had to push the revolution further. Um, large sections of the peasantry had, and large sections of the army had been won over. Um, you know, to the idea that it wasn't enough just to have a parliament instead of a czar, that actually we had to end the war, we have to end exploitation for good, we have to transform the world. Um, and people, you know, so the actual insurrection in October, once that was happening, there wasn't really much violence, hardly any violence, particularly in Petrograd, which was the capital, because the balance of forces was so strongly in favor of the revolution that 
you know, the people who were against it couldn't really do much, though there was no point trying to fight it. You know, if you contrast it with Moscow, where the balance was less strongly in favour of the revolution, there was more violence there, because the old ruling class was more confident to try and defend its position. Um, I think that when we talk about revolution, we're talking about wanting the balance of forces to be so overwhelming that violence is minimised, that you don't really need that because you've got the majority on your side. You know, in that context, I think most of the violence that does take place in a revolution is defensive. It's about defending the revolution against the people who want to turn it back. And the great violence of the Russian Revolution came when sections of the old order, you know, backed up by 14 armies from powers around the rest of Europe uh, and America, uh, invaded Russia to try and reverse the revolution and turn things back um, to how they had been. Uh, and, that in, and in that situation, the revolution had to defend itself. And then, you know, you saw a, a civil war that was organized really by the old regime uh, uh, and the Bolsheviks had to fight it. I think, again, if you look at a more recent example of Egypt in 2011, um, the revolutionaries in Egypt weren't generally interested in inflicting violence. Um, but they defended themselves when the police were sent into the squares to, to attack them and to try and uh, uh, get them to leave. It's now, you know, six years on, now that the revolution has been contained and driven back, now we see the violence, you know, now we see the repression, uh, imprisonment, torture, and so on, exactly like you saw in Russia after the 1905 revolution. I think minimizing violence involves, which I do, which we all want to do, that's what I think we want to do, it involves establishing the maximum possible support for, um, for the revolution and moving decisively once you have that support to, to try and make it happen. Um, and I think hesitating in that, you know, it runs the risk of more violence the, than is necessary. So I think for socialists, the question of violence isn't an abstract one. I think violence flows out of the inequalities um, and the tensions in a class society like the one that we live in. And if we want to end that violence, we have to support the right, firstly, of oppressed people to fight back against that violence every, you know, on, on an everyday basis. But ultimately, we have to fight for the right of the majority to overthrow that whole system through revolutionary change that is about real democracy and about real, you know, imposing the will of actually the majority uh, for the benefit, ultimately, of everyone. Hi there. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, I had a quick question, which was that um, in the class society which we live in, which is so dominated by a global media and almost an oligarchy, which props up these the, the very kinds of class interests against which we all want to struggle, how do you convince ordinary people, ordinary the ordinary populace, that actually our movement is one about self-defense. And because you can, you can imagine if you go on Newsnight or something like that, or on Question Time, you get the irritating do-gooders who often pose as neutrals who are absolutely not that at all, who will say something like, all violence is wrong. Um, you know, for example, the self-defense of the Palestinian people is violence, all of this kind of stuff. How do you actually connect with ordinary people and, and translate a message um, a message of, of actual hope and self-defense um, that ordinary people can really understand. Thank you. Come with that, and then I saw a hand at the back. What I can see is, what, I, what the positive thing I can see, there's a, uh, each time there's a demo now, the crowds get bigger and bigger, but what, what's, the next, what's the next thing? Because... Although there's a hundred, all the people went out uh, la uh, this last Saturday. I, mean, I wasn't one of them, unfortunately. <sighs> they never, you know, they went out, and I just felt like, why don't the kettle uh, trees are may? You know, I was thinking, can you not surround uh, ten Downing Street and not let her out until until uh, she retires, until she gets the fuck out of the <laughs> country? You know. The other thing is, um, the other thing that depresses me is uh, the union, uh, the, what they call the, the, the people ahead of the union. Not, they're not doing enough, you know. They're not bringing out enough strikes, and that, you know. I want to see, I'd like to see more things like that happen. 
But, but what, I just want to know what they think about civil dis disobedience at, when, we're, when, when there is a crowd of over 50,000, not 10 or nothing, but a very, very large amount. I'd like to see something happen. Not too much violent, but I think I, I've, I, I've lived a lot of times and been to hundreds of uh, demos and things. Sometimes of work, but it's one out of ten. And I just want to—I just want to ask the, the team, what is the next step? Because I'm fed up waiting. I'm fed up seeing the young people I know in zero hours contract, including my son, who who lost his job and lost his house and everything and, and things like that. I'm just fed up seeing all these things and up to the up to the thing. So thanks. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, I agree with what you said in principles, but um, I don't know about the situation here. I'm coming from France, and uh, and they, I think that the question of violence now is raised in a peculiar situation. I mean, not just as violence of the system in general, with war, the, mi the migrants dying in the, in the sea, and all these things, racism, and so on. I think violence is uh, raised as well inside the movement uh, about the strategy and the tactics we use. And I give the example about France, where it's becoming very practical. Uh, as you know, I, I think there were a big movement last year against what was called the labor law, a big attack against the workers, and at the same time in a situation where there is a state of emergency, which meant that the police and the state can forbid the demonstration, can search the demonstrators, and so you see some demonstrations, even some demonstration called by the trade unions, where before going inside the demonstration, you have to be, to be searched by the police. Uh, even the, uh, the trade union um, I don't know, uh, foulards uh, uh, are forbidden. So you can go inside the demonstration with a uh, trade union banner or this kind of thing. Uh, there were even some demonstrations where you could only go in at the start, at the beginning of the demonstration, and after that it was sort of wall around the demonstration and you could only leave the demonstration at the end. Uh, so there were some forbidden demonstration uh, in the fight in solidarity with migrants. We fought for camps just for visibility and so on with migrants. And so we had to confront the police every day because they, they were uh, trying to expel even the idea of building a, a camp for migrants. So the question of confrontation with the police is not just an abstract question. It's becoming a question of are you fighting? And are you going to have this confrontation for, with the police? Not because you want to confront the police, but because you want to demonstrate, or because you want to have a strike, to occupy a, a, a workplace, and so on. And so that's the basis on which, and I think, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I think that it's true to say that the main thing is a balance of force. That the main thing, and against you know, the idea of individual violence and so on. But we need to provide, not just waiting for a situation where you will have general strikes, some hundred thousand, even in specific movements, strategy and tactics, sometimes to prevent confrontation with the police because you can't have it, and sometimes organizing the confrontation with the police, even through violence, uh, to be able to uh, to win and to demonstrate or, and so on. And so that's, I would say, a most offensive way of raising the question. Uh, Kevin Mott from Leeds SWP. Just uh, on Sally talking about the Russian Revolution, because I think it's very important, especially this year, obviously. A few years ago, there was an historian who wanted to do a comparative study of the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution. And um, one thing he wanted to do was to look into this business of revolution, and then you get the counter-revolution. And one thing he did was he, he looked up the word revolution in loads of historical dictionaries and found it time and time and time and time again, and when he looked for the word counter-revolution, he hardly ever found it at all. And this is important. This is the ruling class and, you know, it's academics, it's historians, uh, 
to some degree consciously, to some degree unconsciously, they don't want to talk about counter-revolution because it's actually when their side dishes it out to defend. And actually, you know, you can't understand the violence in the Russian Revolution without understanding the Cat Revolution. I'll give you an example, which a lot of the history books don't talk about or, you know, gloss over. The Bolsheviks were very aware that in early 1918, Finland, they'd allowed Finland to separate. There was a civil war in Finland between the workers that were trying to do what the Bolsheviks were doing and the white counter-revolutionaries, the ruling class determined to use violence to keep... And the whites unfortunately won and 10,000 workers were slaughtered. In the Hungarian Soviet Republic, which only lasted briefly and came into power you know, without any violence at all, from what I can make out from my reading, it was a revolution that was virtually supported by the entire Hungarian working class, the Hungarian Soviet Republic. This is 1918. Smashed by white count revolution, 5,000 were, were slaughtered. Uh, this is fantastically important to understand that, that you know, if, we, if we try to uh, have a fundamental transformation in society, and the ruling class will turn to the most disgusting levels of violence, and you know we, we would be disarming ourselves and inviting slaughter like that on our side if we didn't actually have violence organised against it. Just one last thing uh, again: uh, the the civil war that happened in Russia, I think, would have would have been very very brief indeed if it had simply been a Russian affair. But the the white the the, the, the external armies that went in that Sally mentioned prolonged that thing for three years. And people like Churchill were absolutely crucial to that. I came across a quote from Churchill the other day. He's on the five-pound note this year, isn't he? 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution. Churchill said to a British uh, captain that they were sending into Russia, he said to him, get on a train at Vladivostok, go as far west as you can, and then come back blowing up every single bridge on your way back. Right? It was smash the place up as well as shoot people and all, smash the place up. And actually, if we want to understand why the Russian Revolution went wrong and Stalinism, it's actually things like that, I think, more than a pamphlet that Lenin wrote in 1902. Uh, this is very important. Can I just say, people want to respond to any of these points or come back on any questions. We don't have to leave it all to Sally to do at the end, so feel free to come in on any of these points or questions. Uh, hi, uh, Mark Dunk, Lewisham SWP. Um, in terms of coming back on the questions, I think the question that was raised at the start is interesting. Uh, how do we convince everyone? Um, and I don't think it is a question of convincing everyone. It's, uh, I think, I think the, the comrade from France is right. It's not an abstract question. The question of violence is one that comes up uh, at different points in the struggle, uh, in different contexts, and, and as the comrade from France said, with a different balance of forces. Uh, and the important thing for revolutionaries is to be able to assess that balance of forces at the particular moment in, in, in history and decide, uh, are we in a position to go forward, at which we say, actually, we are in a position where we can go uh, and we should use our, the power of force uh, uh, to ensure that we win a victory. Uh, I mean, if we look back to the struggle in South Africa uh, for, for freedom, uh, there was a crucial moment in that where really actually like the, uh, the, the white apartheid state was on the retreat uh, when Mandela called for people to put down uh, uh, their weapons and put them away. And actually, we see where that's led. Actually, it's led to a situation uh, where actually capital stayed in the hands of the people that were oppressing then. Uh, and since then, we've seen uh, the situation with the Marikana miners being shot down, uh, still terrible uh, conditions for the massive South African, uh, black South African workers. Actually, things would have been potentially different uh, if people had used violence then, if Mandela had made a different call, if there had been a rooted revolutionary party in that movement that could have said to people, actually, let's not stop here, let's, dis let's take away uh, the, 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 the means to oppress us from the ruling class. There, uh, in Britain, we've seen uh, the question's probably been posed most directly in the fight against fascism uh, in, in, in the period that's just gone past, and I think it was absolutely crucial in driving back the British National Party and the EDL after them that there was a rooted revolutionary organisation, the SWP, that at various points in those struggles went, actually, what we need is a mass movement on the streets 
uh, could look at the turnout on those demonstrations and at particular points go, look, we're going to push through the police here. We've got the numbers to do it. Let's go and smash these Nazis. And actually, that's how we broke them and that's how we'll have to break them again uh, if this uh, Football Lads Alliance thing turns into a, into a fascist street movement in Britain again. But to do all these things, to make that assessment of the balance of forces and make those calls, you have to have a revolutionary party. Uh, and that's why I'd uh, uh, I urge anyone who's not in the SWP to consider joining us. Um, yeah, I think the comrade before me has kind of answered the question about, about self-defense. I just think, um, and, you know, getting people to realize, because I know, um, I, you know, especially on the demos, like, against Trump at the start of the year and stuff, there's a lot of people on there for the very first time. Um, and, you know, you do get people who will say, oh, I, you know, I don't know about going on protests. You guys are just as bad as the, the other guys. Like, the, the, the far left are just as bad as the other ones, you know, because everyone gets violent on protests and actually um, when they come on protests and they go, oh, wait a minute, no, that's not right. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I myself as an example, like getting involved um, in the struggle because, you know, I was initially um, angry about the minimum wage in this country. I, you know, I, could, I was working loads of hours and couldn't um, make enough to ends meet to make ends meet, um, but then sat, went on a protest and, you know, I had heard these kind of things where people just break out and riots and stuff like that and actually went on a protest and found that wasn't true. Um, and actually the only time I've come across violence on a protest was against, against the, was the anti, um, the UAF, United Against Fascism protest against the EDL, um, where the police were started to shove us because they didn't want us um, interrupting the EDL protests or trying to stop them from marching. And we got like shoved uh, all the way to like this pen out of the way of everyone um, to protest uh, against the EDL. And actually the fascists got protected. Um, so that's the only time I've actually experienced um, violence on a, on a protest. And I think um, that my point really is that basically actually making the arguments for people when you go into these protests or bringing people into struggle, like for example, you know, against the protests against building against um, Theresa May, trying to get the Tories out, actually, we're bringing these arguments in um, to these struggles, getting pe what more people involved will not only, um, you know, stop police, not stop the police, but, you know, would actually re make people realise that, um, uh, that it's not the left who are getting all getting violent it's actually the police but also um make people realize that yeah self-defense is necessary and um yeah that's it really so there's still more time if people want to come in on the, discu on the discussion um duncan smith edinburgh swp the thing I want to talk about is the example of Syria after the Arab Spring 2011. In Syria, like many countries in the region, he had a, a, a mass movement against the dictatorship of Assad, a movement on the streets, which was going to be confronted and was confronted by violence from the beginning. Um, I think what is significant, what's happened subsequently, you know, Assad was able to turn the whole conflict into, into uh, a sectarian civil war. I think the lessons there, for one, comparing it with 1917, you didn't have a, a mass revolutionary party who would argue against sectarianism, who would argue against, in the Russian case, anti-Semitism, for example. You didn't have a mass party that was arguing that kind of thing and unifying the democratic struggle against, against Assad. So Assad was able to use all the different divisions that exist in Syria uh, to his own advantage. But also, I think a second major point and difference with 1917 is the mass democratic movement wasn't able to split the army. So therefore, Syrian, although some people from the Syrian armed forces joined the opposition, certainly not enough did, didn't come with enough weapons and so on and so forth. So he had the regime facing a, a, a mass movement on the streets, but still, being able to wield massive violence against that essentially peaceful protest. Um, so, the, uh, you know, my question is, what would we as revolutionaries have done in 2011 when there was still a mass movement in the street in Syria and we were there? The regime is not going to stop at nothing, you know, as we know, dropping barrel bombs on civil populations, 
quite prepared to murder people in large numbers, what would we have done in that situation? Would you have said, actually, we cannot succeed, we need to go underground? Because what subsequently happened is that, if you like, the democratic and socialist forces that were on the ground got marginalized by sectarian groups uh, on both sides. The army wasn't split, and I think that's a, a major issue we'd have to grapple with if we were there in 2011. In fact, if we were there now, if we could remain there. Thank you. Right. As I've said, there's still time if people want to indicate they want to participate in the discussion. I've got one hand so far still remaining to call, but I'm giving you time to um, think about whether you want to come in on the discussion or ask any questions. Yeah, fine, I've seen you. Thank you. Um, I'll take the comrade here. Then I've got one more hand, but there is still time. Uh, we've got about another 10 possible minutes <coughs> if you want to kind of bring on the discussion. Yeah, I just wanted to come back um, on the question of like how violence corrupts you, because I think that's one of the biggest arguments you always hear is that once you use violent tactics, uh, you're somehow as bad as the people in power. And so you forfeit any right to have any sort of, uh, you know, moral authority over them and that, you know, using violence will corrupt you. And I think as socialists, it is important to stress, as Sally did, that actually we're against violence. I think the main reason most people are here in this room is because we see a violent world and we want to change it. Uh, you know, we don't use violence as a starting point. It's not when, when it's not like when we say, you know, you should do a socialist worker stall. You should have a rifle on your shoulder. We don't, we don't think that that violence is the starting point. But also, we don't say um, that violence should be reduced to a moral question, um, because once you look at violence through a moralist lens, really you're saying that violence is, is an abstract thing, and that whoever uses it, it's exactly the same. Uh, so like Sally said, you know, a Palestinian kid throwing a rock at an IDF tank is exactly the same as a soldier who's in that tank. Or, you know, the suffragettes who smashed up shops and so on are just as bad as the people in power who were refusing them the right to vote. And actually, that's why we say you shouldn't take that position and that taking a moralist position, as I think, you know, in case, some cases people like Gandhi did, I think means you don't take the side of the oppressed over the oppressor. But this isn't to criticise uh, people like Gandhi or Martin Luther King. You know, these people are obviously giants and so on. And, you know, they are, the, the movements that they led, the, non, the non-violent movements, were incredibly black, brave, successful, inspiring, and so on. I think what we do have to take issue with, though, is the narrative that is pushed in the history books that the reason India got independence is because Gandhi was a civilised person who had tea with the British and he negotiated independence for them. Uh, this is bullshit. The reason that India won independence, of course Gandhi played a role, but it's because uh, millions of Indians uh, marched on the streets, they struck, they blew up British police stations, they blew up British railway lines, they attacked the British army and so on, and that forced the British out of India. And that's important for us to recognise, because I think it shows that when you take a mor- if you simply take a moral view of violence, you don't end up taking a side of the oppression. And I guess that, that really answers the question about how do you convince the mass of people, the question that the comrade at back asked, how do you convince the mass of people um, to not be against violence and not to follow what the media sell? Well, I think that, you know, the Indian example is a good one because you can bet your life that the British ruling caste that all the Indian press and so on would have denounced the independence movement, but it had the mass of support of the people. And ordinary Indians would have refused to victimise those Indians who faced jail for blowing up British police stations and so on. And I think that's the answer. It's saying that when it's just violence, it's very difficult to get a mass support behind it. And that's why we don't use violence as a starting point. But when it's a mass movement that can use force against those in power, and it's about building revolutionary change that isn't just focused on violence, then you can win the support of ordinary people as well. Thank you. I've got got one last speaker. If you want to come in the discussion, indicate while while this comrade is speaking. Otherwise, I'm going to then bring Sally to come back and sum up the discussion so far. Comrade. when I hear the uh, the ruling class uh, attacking like uh, like a mi- miners picket line, you know, the, they call them the miners all being violent. Well, all I should see there is just sheer hypocrisy come from the working class as such, you know. And you, you got to ask yourself how, how violent were the police against all the miners? And there was a lot of miners arrested then, and none of them were charged. They all got off on the charge. Well, another qu- question is. How many police officers were charged for that kind of violence? None as I'm aware of. That's just one point. Another point, point is, uh, when the EDL decide to uh, attack a mosque, 
Do we sit back and do nothing? No. We get there in numbers and physically defend that mosque as such, you know. And when it comes down to, like, finally to get social changes as such, like, you know, well, I think you have to be physical about it, you know. Not, not only that, uh, as part of the class war against the ruling class, we've got the numbers to do it. But not only have we got the numbers to do it, we've got the ideas to do it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Right, OK, one last go. Yeah, fine. <laughs> Gwen Comrade from uh, York. I was very interested in your introduction because on the train today, I was sitting next to a woman who professed to be a socialist uh, in the Socialist Party. And she dug up some old rumours and then she said to me, but you're very aggressive in the SWP, <coughs> you, you know, and, uh, and you spoil so many demonstrations. So I said, well, have you been on any and, and what are you talking about? Which ones? And she couldn't name any. <laughs> and it was evident that she then began to quote the press and what she'd read and what she'd heard. And I think that is one of the things that we have to in a word, fight against, without necessarily going to violence, but fight against this perception that because we are different, because we are passionate about what we want and we want change, that, you know, we are perceived as, as being uh, violent and aggressive. The only aggression I have ever encountered is when we've been facing either the EDL or the BNP or when we went to protest against uh, UKIP in, um, in Doncaster... Uh, when they started, the fascists started to attack us. You know, that's all I've seen. I haven't seen, you know, any where we've precipitated it. I think we're right. We defend, uh, if you like, people ha who appear defenceless or are, are being attacked themselves. But I would have liked to... Your introduction was so good because I would have liked to have talked to her about all these other violences, like the murders of people in the Mediterranean because people won't pick them up, about the number of suicides through austerity. And I really wish, I, I hope, I see her on the way back because she's gone on a course and she's back on a train on Sunday. I don't know which one. But I'd dearly like to, you know, to root her out and say, look, I'll give you the other aspect of violence that you never consider, you know. But I do think it's the media, it's Murdoch, it's the perception that we go and we spoil things because we are there at all. And recently in York, there was a, um, a demonstration with Momentum and everybody uh, on the, uh, the day that Joe Cox had said that we, uh, Joe Cox's relatives have said that we ought to all work together. And uh, she was there at that day. And she said, well, what do you think? She said, you had a message on your posters that we agreed with, but we didn't agree with socialist worker at the top. You'd be much better if you kept worker out of it. And I said, oh, would you like us to keep um, socialist out of it as well? <laughs> and, you know, she, she just... I said, once you start outlawing people's banners, once you start outlawing their pamphlets, then you're into the business of burning books and burning anything that's different, aren't you? And uh, she really was a mixed-up socialist. That's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you to everybody who contributed to, to the discussion this afternoon. I'm going to bring Sally back to sum up the discussion and debate. Sally. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, I think the, the, the questions about, like, what, what's the next step from a mass demo, you know, the question of civil disobedience and the question of how you connect um, with ordinary people, these things are obviously the crucial questions, aren't they, for all of us every day, really. And I think there's a whole number of factors that come into to all of those questions um, um, uh, and kind of shape um, the answers to those, really. Because I guess you start from looking at how do people's ideas change. Um, you know, Socialist Workers' Party, in various forms, has existed for 50-odd years, 60 years, whatever. You know, we've had a fairly consistent set of politics that we've argued through that time. Um, the amount of influence we have changes, and it's not necessarily in, in our control all the time how, you know, how much our ideas kind of connect 
with, um, with wider layers of people in society. And I think that's because, you know, bigger factors also are involved in, in shaping that, in shaping how much and how many people are prepared to challenge not just, you know, this or that individual problem, but the whole question of capitalism as a system and, and how you change it. And I think, you know, at the moment, for example, in Britain, we've seen a shift, haven't we? We've seen a shift that, you know, Corbyn kind of represents. He's become a figurehead for a, a, a set of ideas about challenging um, capitalism, challenging austerity, you know, challenging the power of the ruling class and all the wealth of the, the ruling class, really. Um, and I think also the Grenfell fire just kind of... Um, magnified that a, a million times really uh, coming just after the election and it it changes how people look at, at protests when you think about when when the residents and, and and local people from Grenfell had that protest just after the fire and kind of forced their way into the town hall which by the way the idea that people should have to force their way into a public building which is meant to be there to represent them you know is is ridiculous and just says exactly um, what's going on, you know, in terms of the, how limited democracy is um, in our society. But actually, I don't think anyone in the, in the country, you know, or hardly anyone, question their right to do that, you know, question their right to, to use force to demand answers about what had just happened. Um, and I think that's because, because of that shift, because, it, you know, because it exposes how much class society, you know, really kills people and, and needs to be, have something done about it. It doesn't mean everyone's become a revolutionary, but it does mean everyone wants to, you know, see a shift in that balance of power um, in society. And I think that changes lots of people's ideas. I think it opens up, you know, and I think Corbynism before that has kind of opened up or, or exposed and brought to the surface the idea of, of socialist ideas, of saying that we should be taking wealth off the rich and giving it to the poor, you know, and, and all of those things. You know, so I think there's a bigger audience for socialist ideas now um, uh, than there was before. And I think we connect with people uh, on that basis of, of arguing, you know, against austerity, fighting to defend, you know, people to raise the question of racism inside of, you know, an issue like Grenfell and, and everything else. And, and I think it's interesting, isn't it, just from what the last speaker was saying, um, this had been an argument that, that I'd come across, you know, from some people saying that socialist workers shouldn't turn up with placards at, at, at the Grenfell demonstrations, you know, like it's just jumping on a, on a bandwagon kind of thing. But I think we should be really confident and, and feel really proud to be socialists who've been part of fighting for council housing and fighting against racism and fighting for working class people to have a voice, you know, over decades, actually. And that's precisely what, what is needed. You know, and the reason that we have our name on, on the placards is, is because our placards have slogans which represent a particular set of politics that, that our organisation advocates and people need to know who we are when we say that. We can't, you know, hide it and pretend we're not socialist worker. I think that's, a, you know, an undemocratic way to act, isn't it? Um, but I do think that, uh, you know, I think times like now mean that, that ordinary people, you know, working class people... Um, can, you know, make leaps in terms of how they support, you know, movements and, and challenges to the system and stuff. And so I think when we think about, you know, you can go on lots and lots of mass demonstrations or small demonstrations, some big ones and so on. Um, I think part of the answer to your question about what's next after a demo was partly in, in something what you said as well about the trade union bureaucrats and the, the lack of a, a lead in terms of the working class movement in this country and the need for more of that, really, the need for more struggle um, in the workplaces and in the trade unions. Um, and I think that's a really important part of it because, of course, demonstrations are fantastically important. They're a brilliant way to get a lot of people together to show a kind of a sense of a, of a democratic mass movement and have people's voices being heard. Um, but, you know, a demonstration on a Saturday where everyone comes down on their day off does not pose a major threat to capitalism as it exists. You know, where, where is the power of capitalism? And that is in the way that it exploits people every single day to get them to produce a profit that uh, keeps the system going, that keeps, you know, profits coming in for the bosses and keeps allowing them to reinvest and, and all the rest of it. Um, that's where the power really is. So I do think that the next step... 
you know, I think, you know, when demonstrations are, um, you know, sometimes confronting the police and so on, and particularly anti-fascist ones in this country, um, that's often been uh, necessary. You know, and I would say, though, that certainly in our recent experience in Britain, last couple of decades, it's not necessarily been a case of, of violence as such, as in turning up with weapons or something. It, it has been a case of, you know, being prepared to confront the police, to try and break police lines, to get through, you know, uh, uh, with the demonstration and so on. The same was true of the anti-capitalist movement in, you know, 15, 20 years ago, where there was a high level of repression, exactly the kind of same thing that the, the comrade from France was talking about, of being kettled, of not, you know, being allowed in and out of the demonstration one at a time and having to show your ID, all of this kind of stuff, and a whole series of May Day demonstrations around the, the year 2000. Um, and absolutely, we were part of saying that, our, you know, we have to fight for the right to protest and we have to, you know, force ourselves on the streets and, and break through police lines if we can. But, of course, that for us involved having the numbers um, to do it and, um, you know, trying to measure, you know, when is it worth us being kettled for eight hours or 12 hours or 15 hours? And when is it, you know, when are we able to actually push it further and, and break through those lines and stuff? You know, so I think I think the kind of the civil disobedience and the the kind of demonstrations that confront the the state on on this kind of on one level is important. But the next step really is how do we actually um, disrupt the workings of capital? And I think that happens in the workplaces, and that happens in in mass struggles of of working class people through you know through their unions and through um, organising at work and in communities because that's that's where it really hurts them and that kind of takes a, a movement on the streets to the next level. And I think again that's something that you saw in Egypt where there was a, a combination of the occupations of the squares but also then the, the strikes in, in universities, in the um, garment industry, you know, and other things. There wasn't enough of that, you know, to, to make the movement strong enough to push forward, but actually it was an element of the movement which, which gives so much more power to simply an occupation of, of the town square or whatever. Um, and I think that's, that's where we have to look. You know, I've been reading recently about the Wobblies, the, the in, Industrial Workers of the World the Union, that organized in the early 20th century in America. My God, the level of repression they faced is incredible, you, you know, in a country that we think of as somehow, you know, a, a Western democracy type country where this kind of thing couldn't possibly happen. But actually, the level of repression that American workers faced, you know, in the years running up to the First World War and the years afterwards and in the 30s as well, actually, is, is incredible. And those people organized simply for the right to be in a union and for the right to, you know, have uh, rights at work and so on. And they were prepared to die in order to fight for that right. Uh, and I think that's, you know, in that situation, they had to do that. But I think it is always a judgment, isn't it? Uh, we're not for martyrdom. We're not for, like, throwing ourselves um, to, the, to the walls for the sake of it. We are always for trying to build a broader um, uh, mass movement that involves um, the biggest number of working class people and trying to convince uh, a, a majority. I think convincing a majority isn't done by simply one-on-one -on -one arguments. You know, it's not like we eventually will get around to everyone and, and talk them into socialism. It's that, you know, uh, that complex interaction of the confidence or lack of confidence of the ruling class, the confidence of our side, you know, a victory on our side can make people, loads more people feel that it's possible to win. And that gives people the confidence to come out and be part of a movement or to organize something at work or, you know, be part of a demonstration to challenge racist ideas, you know, and so on and so forth. All of those things feed into how, how confident people feel to fight. I think the role... You know, for us, you know, at a time like right now, you know, we're not on the verge of revolution, I'm sad to tell you, in, in Britain today. However, we are in a moment where there's a real shift taking place. You know, I think people will look back at the election and at Grenfell and see that as a watershed moment that changed things in Britain. And I think, you know, the job for socialists is to think, how do we um, impact on that situation in the best possible way to make 
the widest number of people, working class people, feel more confident to fight, feel more confident to take on their boss and take on, you know, the Tory government, take on austerity and, and take on all of those kind of ideas that divide us and stop us from doing that. You know, how do we come out of this situation with more people feeling like it's possible to change the world? And that's, that's kind of the focus. That's where, you know, we would say we're prepared to use force when we need to, but what we really want is the, is the confidence of the biggest number of people to say that we can change the world.